Hi, and thanks for watching. Melchizedek. He's got to be one of the most fascinating of the biblical characters. He makes a brief appearance in Genesis 14. He shows up in the highly significant Psalm, Psalm 110, where he's connected to the Messiah's priesthood. And of course, he features prominently in the letter to the Hebrews, especially in chapter 7. There's also non-biblical writings about him, Jewish literature from the first century, Josephus and Philo, the Dead Sea Scrolls, a document known as Second Enoch. And together, all of these provide us with quite a picture of this biblical figure from way back in Abraham's day. In fact, I was so fascinated by Melchizedek that I spent a couple of years researching him and wrote my master's thesis about Melchizedek. So what I want to do is look at the biblical evidence as well as the non-biblical evidence especially from the Dead Sea Scrolls and Second Enoch, to help us to have a better understanding of exactly what various people were saying about Melchizedek in the first century, in order that we might then approach the letter to the Hebrews and better understand exactly what the letter to the Hebrews is telling us about Melchizedek. So sometimes you want to ask, will the real Melchizedek stand up? Because there's all sorts of identities that have been placed upon who exactly he is. Everything from a uh, Canaanite priest king, a historical figure, to what some Christians think, that he's the pre-incarnate Christ, the appearance of the Son of God before his incarnation. Jewish tradition identifies him as Noah's son Shem, just known by a different name. Some Jewish literature speculates that he was an angelic redeemer or the manifestation of the Logos. Some say that he was an end-time priest, and some early Christians thought that he was, in fact, the Holy Spirit. So, as you can tell, there's all sorts of identities that have been placed upon Melchizedek. Well, why don't we start, first of all, with what the scriptures themselves tell us. The first appearance of Melchizedek in the biblical canon is in Genesis chapter 14. Genesis 14, if you remember, is the story of when Abraham took his men and they pursued the four kings which had captured his nephew Lot and a lot of other people and possessions. Abraham and his men defeated those kings and they brought back Lot and all the people to where they had lived. The king of Sodom comes out to meet them and then another king, the king of Salem, comes out to meet him. That's where we pick up in Genesis 14. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Now, it seems as if every single detail of this particular text has been mined by latest Jew later Jewish writers in trying to kind of identify exactly the significance of Melchizedek. Everything from his name to the name of the city where he served as a priest and a king to his actions with Abraham, the bringing out of bread and wine, as well as Abram giving him a tithe of all the possessions. So we'll, we'll return to those as we proceed through all these other texts that tell us about Melchizedek. We want to first go, though, to the other Old Testament text which tells us about Melchizedek and his significance. This is from Psalm 110. Psalm 110 is a highly important psalm. In fact, of all the Old Testament texts that are either quoted or alluded to in the New Testament, Psalm 110 has more than any of the others. It is the most old, frequently old cited Old Testament text in the New Testament. You may know the first verse, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. But you might not be as familiar with the fourth verse. This is where Melchizedek enters the picture. It says, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, not only is the anointed one of God, the Messiah, going to sit at Yahweh's right hand and put all his enemies beneath his feet as the victorious king, but he's also going to be a priest. But he's not going to be a priest like the priest of Aaron and his sons. Instead, he is going to inherit the priesthood of Melchizedek, whatever that means. Well, we're going to have to wait to find out what that means when we get to the letter to the Hebrews. But bear in mind that because this psalm put a connection, an explicit connection between Melchizedek and the Messiah, that invited a lot of later Jewish writings to engage in speculation about who he was and his significance in the biblical narrative. 
Now, one of these speculations about Melchizedek is from the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's known as 11Q Melchizedek. 11 because it was found in cave 11, Q because it's part of the Qumran manuscripts, and Melchizedek because, of course, of the subject of this particular document. It was written in Hebrew sometime within the 100-year span of about 50 BC to AD 50, and it was first made known to the world in a scholarly publication that came out in 1965. What is 11Q Melchizedek all about, and how does Melchizedek himself fit into this particular document? Well, 11Q Melchizedek divides history into jubilee periods. This was relatively common for Jewish literature of the day. It just so happens that this document is about the 10th and the final jubilee of world history. So this is end of the world kind of stuff. Melchizedek appears from heaven as the general of the heavenly armies, He's the visible representative of God, and he's the redeemer of the Lord's people. Not only that, but he appears on Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement, thus indicative of the priestly role that he is going to play in this end-time scenario. And as if that was not enough, he's called El, or Elohim, God. So we've, we've come a long way from Genesis chapter 14 when we get to 11 Q Melchizedek. Because all of a sudden now we no longer have a historic king and priest in the city of Salem. But now we have this heavenly angelic redeemer figure who appears at the end of time as the leader of the Lord's armies in order to redeem the sons of light, the followers of God. And he begins this victorious march on Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement, which of course is a highly priestly festival in Israel's calendar. So keep all of that in mind as we jump to probably the most bizarre of the Melchizedek traditions. And this is in a document known as Second Enoch. There was a lot of Enoch literature that circulated in the first centuries. It was well known to the Jews of the first century. In fact, First Enoch is quoted in the New Testament or at least alluded to. This is Second Enoch where Melchizedek makes his appearance. It's basically a midrash, which is a, a word for Jewish interpretation, often creative. A midrash on Genesis chapter 5, where Enoch makes his appearance in the biblical story. It was probably written around the first century AD, although scholars dispute its dating. But if it is for the first century AD, that locates it as a contemporaneous writing with the letter to the Hebrews. Now, it's divided by scholars into 73 chapters. The first few chapters talk about Enoch's ascent through the seven heavens, his instruction by angels. And you get to the end, and we have this wild and crazy story about the birth of a child priest named Melchizedek. So here's how the story goes. Noah has a brother whose name is Nir, and Nir is married to Sopanim. But this couple are childless. They've never been able to have any children. And all of a sudden, even though Nir and Sopanim are separated one from another and thus not having intercourse, she becomes miraculously pregnant. When Nir finds out, he confronts her, and the shock of the encounter actually kills Sopanim. She dies before she's able to give birth to her child. Noah and Nir leave her body. They come back to prepare for her burial, and sitting on the edge of her bed is a child a son who is fully developed. He has the badge of priesthood on his chest, and he opens his mouth to bless the Lord. It's at that point that they name him Melchizedek. Later in the story, the archangel Gabriel takes Melchizedek from earth to heaven to await the flood, and then after the flood, the archangel Gabriel will bring Melchizedek back down from heaven to earth where he will establish or re-establish the priesthood. So if 11 Q Melchizedek seems strange to you, well, 2 Enoch is even stranger because now we have this pre-Diluvian, this pre-flood figure who doesn't seem to have a father and he's born from a dead mother and he's a precocious wunderkind. He's, he's already fully developed and he has this priestly badge on his chest and he's already opening his mouth to bless the Lord. And he becomes the establisher of this new priesthood after the flood. Then, with all of this in mind, we jump to a couple of other Jewish writers who, even though they didn't say quite as much about Melchizedek, still expanded on the biblical narrative. And these two figures are Philo and 
Josephus. We've talked about Philo as well as Josephus in some of the earlier videos. Philo was a contemporary of Jesus. He was a Jewish philosopher who lived in Egypt. He left us a vast body of literature. And in four of his writings, he talks about Melchizedek. He describes him as a king of peace. So he's translating king of Salem as king of peace, which is the same thing that Hebrews chapter 7 does. He also calls him God's own priest. And not only that, not only is he a priest, but he is a a visible representation on earth of the Logos. And all his thoughts are vast and sublime. And he hasn't inherited the priesthood from anyone. His inheritance, his his priesthood is automathe, Philo says. It's self-taught. It's autodidacton. It's instinctive. So Philo goes beyond the biblical narrative to describe who Melchizedek is. But he's not alone. Josephus, who was a little bit later than Jesus, he's late first century, a, a Jewish historian who also has left us a vast body of literature. And in two of his writings, in Wars and Antiquities, he also talks about Melchizedek. He describes him as a Canaanite chieftain, a righteous king, that he was the original founder of the city in which he lived. And he was also, Josephus says, the first to officiate as priest, the first to build a temple. And he's the one who renamed Salem Jerusalem. So even though Philo and Josephus are a little bit more conservative in what they have to say about Melchizedek as in comparison to 11Q Melchizedek and in comparison to 2nd Enoch, they still take the biblical story and they expand on these details to tell us a little bit more about who they thought Melchizedek was. Let's kind of take all of this together and, and regroup what we've learned so far before we jump into the letter of the Hebrews. What do we know? We know that there's basically a couple of different trajectories that speculations about Melchizedek go. One is that he is a historical figure, that he's a Canaanite chieftain, a priest, a king, founder of Jerusalem, representative of the Logos, and he has this enduring priesthood that's connected to the Messianic king. But there's also a trajectory which locates him more as a heavenly figure, where he's either an angel or a divine redeemer, leader of the heavenly armies, precocious child with no father and a dead mother, the founder of a post-flood priesthood, and he's the end-time priest in the final jubilee of world history. So all of this was kind of swirling around in the environment when the letter to the Hebrews was written. These speculations about Melchizedek would have been known to Jews. They would have known the various myths and, and speculations and traditions about Melchizedek. So keep that in mind when we jump into the letter to the Hebrews, because this is going to be important for understanding exactly why the author of the Hebrews, seemingly out of the blue, picked Melchizedek to talk about his connection to the Messiah. Well, let's jump, first of all, into the most important chapter in Hebrews for understanding Melchizedek, and that is chapter 7. Here's how the chapter begins. This Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest to the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abram apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then he's also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. Now, we're going to return to those points in just a minute, but bear in mind that the main reason that the author of the Hebrews brings up Melchizedek is to say that the Messiah, according to Psalm 110, has a priesthood according to the order of Melchizedek and not according to the order of Aaron. He's showing that Christ has a priesthood like Melchizedek, and Melchizedek has a priesthood that is superior to that of Aaron and his sons. It predates the priesthood of Aaron, and Abraham himself, this great patriarch, paid tithes to Melchizedek and received a blessing from Melchizedek, thereby, according to the author of Hebrews, indicating that Melchizedek is superior even to Abraham. So that's the way that starts out. When we get to answering the question, who is Melchizedek, there's a, there's a couple of things to bear in mind about who he is not. First of all, in the book of Hebrews, Melchizedek is not a typical kind of comparison and then contrast figure like a lot of the other people in, in the book of Hebrews. So what Hebrews will do, it will, it will compare Christ to the priest, but then show how Christ is superior to the priest. 
or will compare Christ to Moses, but show how Christ is superior to Moses. Does the same thing with Aaron. But even though the Messiah and Melchizedek are compared one to another, are joined one to another, it's never said that the Messiah is superior to Melchizedek. They're just joined one to another in the priesthood that they share. Secondly, this is not an Old Testament Christophany. Melchizedek is not a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ because it says that he resembles the Son of God or he's made like the Son of God and that he continues a priest forever. But these are two separate figures. I say that because there are some Christians who believe that he is, in fact, a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. But we don't have biblical justification for that. Instead, the two are compared one to another. They are not equated as if they were the same figure. Now, let's jump into what is by far the most unlikely of descriptions, or at least unexpected of descriptions, of who Melchizedek was in the book of Hebrews. This is from those verses that I already read, where there's this string of withouts, these alpha privatives in the Greek, in which something is said to be lacking. So he's without father, without mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days, without end of life, and he's made like the Son of of God. Now, what's going on here with all of this? Well, I would argue that based upon what we've learned, based upon everything that we've heard from the Dead Sea Scrolls and from Second Enoch and the speculations in both Philo and Hebrews, that what's going on here is that the author of Hebrews is simply reflecting various traditions and speculations about the person of Melchizedek. He is saying nothing that his audience would not already have been familiar with. They were part of the ethos of this day. They were immersed in this Jewish culture in which these various traditions about biblical figures circulated around. So what the author of Hebrews was telling them was not going to be radically new. They were familiar with what was being said about Melchizedek in their time. So he, the author to the Hebrews, is building upon this speculation, building upon all of these various traditions about Melchizedek in order to further his argumentation about the superiority of the priesthood of Christ. So what is happening? He's, the author of Hebrews is echoing the views of others in his culture regarding Melchizedek without necessarily espousing those views as true. He's simply saying, you've heard about this Melchizedek. You've heard what people are saying about him, that he's without father and without mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life. You know these traditions about, these Jewish traditions about Melchizedek. And, and in that way, he is like the Son of God. Well, this is not something that only happens here in the New Testament. Paul does something similar to this when he cites in 2 Timothy 3, verse 8, he cites the non-biblical names of the Egyptian magicians, Janes and Jambres, or Yanes and Yambres. Now, if you go back to the book of Exodus, the names of the Egyptian magicians are not given there. Instead, these names were Jewish traditions that were attached to these particular Egyptian magicians. And we have these names that are reflected in other Jewish literature that was contemporaneous with Paul. We have it, for instance, in the Damascus document, which was another text that's found among the Dead Sea Scrolls and found as, in as far away as the, the Geniza in, in Cairo. The, the synagogue there had a Geniza that also had a Damascus document located in it. And the Damascus, Damascus document, just like Paul does, is simply using this tradition to talk about these Egyptian magicians. So, just like the author of Hebrews is reflecting these traditions about Melchizedek, Paul does the same thing when he reflects those traditions about the names of these Egyptian magicians. All of this in order to help us to understand the significance of reading non-biblical literature when we're interpreting the scriptures themselves. If you didn't know about Elibiki Melchizedek, if you didn't know about Second Enoch, if you didn't know what Philo and Josephus were saying about Melchizedek, in other words, if you weren't aware of these traditions that were present in the first century outside of the biblical canon, then what the author of Hebrews says wouldn't make any sense. But now that you know that that swirling all around the people that the letter to the Hebrews was addressed to, as well as the author, now that you know all of these traditions were out there, you can see why he said what he said at the beginning of Hebrews chapter 7. He was reflecting traditions that were present in that particular culture 
in order to further his argumentation about the superiority of the priesthood of Christ. He's not necessarily espousing the truthfulness of these speculations. He's simply using them as a springboard whereby he can talk more about the priesthood of Christ. Now, if you find this fascinating, as I found it fascinating, I'm going to put in my notes a link where you can read either the whole thing or read portions of the thesis that I referred to earlier about Melchizedek and biblical and non-biblical traditions. But mostly, I just hope that it is is helpful for you to understand why we read not just the Bible when we interpret it, but we read literature outside the Bible in order that we might more fully understand that every biblical author was situated in a unique place and time. They were surrounded by text and traditions and myths in their culture, and all of these had the potential to shape their worldview and the way that they expressed themselves. So reading this literature outside the Bible helps us to understand better the Bible itself. So as always, thank you for watching. I hope that you're all doing well, and I look forward to making more of these videos in the future. Peace be with you all. Thank you.